Well, thank you very much for that um, very kind welcome. Uh, may I assure you that what I've been drinking uh, is entirely innocent of any uh, admixture that might affect the uh, progress of this lecture. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, I've had lots of experiences today, uh, been offloaded um, airplanes and uh, had to travel by road from Washington and all sorts of things. But what I didn't know was that I'd be allowed to change in the bridal suite. <laughs> and, uh, so the real miracle was not Bishop Julian and myself emerging from the bridal suite. Uh, I think the real miracle is that I'm here at all. Uh, I, at 12 o'clock this afternoon, if you'd asked me, I would have said my chances of getting here were absolutely nil. So miracles do happen. Praise the Lord for that. Um, well, um, I've got a number of things to say to you, and no doubt uh, you have things to say to me. Um, so let us begin. I would like to begin, I think, uh, by saying a little bit about the importance of the personal dimension of the spiritual. Uh, I say this because a great deal of what I will say will not be about that. But we need at the very outset to acknowledge uh, the importance of this um, medieval Christian uh, mystics, for instance, uh, St. Teresa of Avila or uh, Catherine of Siena or Hildegard of Bingen, all women, by the way, uh, recognize the importance of the personal, uh, the personal dimension of the spiritual, and wrote a great deal about it. Uh, in the same way, the great uh, Islamic historian and pioneer, uh, pioneer sociologist from the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, uh, was the first in the Islamic world to recognize the relationship of spiritual experience to what we now know as the subliminal self. Um, and um, he did this in a number of ways, and I may come back to that. But uh, for Muslims, for Christians, for Jews, this uh, personal dimension of the spiritual is, of course, important. And we can't uh, hope to understand uh, people and their beliefs without acknowledging that they make sense of their lives uh, because of this personal dimension of the spiritual. Uh, and they give... Um, direction to their lives and also make sense of the world in which we live in this way. William James, uh, in his Varieties of Religious Experience, acknowledged the, the simple facticity of this aspect uh, of the spiritual, uh, that we, whatever we make of it, we cannot deny that people have this dimension about them. Uh, and similarly, uh, building on the work of Ibn Khaldun, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, the great Islamic philosopher, uh, also said that whatever else uh, philosophers and scientists may do, they must recognize that Muslims have these experiences. Now, what we make of them, we shall see. Uh, but I think we need to note uh, that this is so uh, for Muslims, Christians, Jews, and indeed for many other people. Uh, one of um, my um, greatly admired colleagues has done a lot of research on people uh, who have no religious affiliation. And yet uh, he and his collaborator have discovered uh, that these people also have a spiritual dimension to them. It may be inarticulate, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is there, and um, they use it um, to order their lives uh, to one extent or another. Um, so I think it's right to begin with this, uh, that the, this personal dimension of the spiritual is not a virus that invades the human personality from outside. Um, it is not a corruption of otherwise normal people. It is actually something that is innate in us. Uh, and all the research suggests this. So if we're going to be properly scientific, uh, that's the way uh, to go. But of course the term religion itself, uh, the very word itself, alerts us uh, to something more than that. 
It alerts us to the social dimension of the spiritual. That is what religio means, to bind together. And in almost every culture, in every society, in every age, uh, people's beliefs, religion in this sense, has been the glue that has stuck society together. Uh, this is what you might call the cohesive aspect of the spiritual. Uh, this is so, for instance, in terms of the development of law. Um, of course, people without re uh, religious belief um, can be uh, moral, perhaps more moral than people with religious beliefs. Um, but what we cannot deny is that the great moral codes have arisen within religious systems, whether it's the laws of Manu, the Torah of Israel, the Sharia of Islam, uh, the law of Christ, um, that St. Paul calls um, the law by which we live as believers. I mean, all of these um, have arisen within a religious framework. And um, in every society, in every culture, uh, this uh, moral sense of law has also influenced the development of public law uh, in one way or another. I mean, it's not for us to debate uh, the extent to which it has, uh, but it, it, it certainly has. Uh, and beliefs have also influenced custom, uh, people's values, I mean, all that kind of thing, nearly universally. Except, of course, uh, with secularization. And uh, the great sort of pundits of secularization claim that in this process, uh, what has happened is that democracy and the welfare state uh, have replaced or are replacing this uh, cohesive function of religious belief. So democracy, according to Brian Wilson, the father of British sociologists, uh, democracy, according to him, now legitimizes what religion used to legitimize. You see? Uh, and the welfare state, again according to him, provides for everything that the churches at one time provided for. Well, I mean, we can see the truth of this to some extent, but is it wholly true? Does democracy provide uh, all the legitimation that is needed? Um, Aaron very kindly referred to my experience in the legislature. Well, even at that level, issues uh, come up uh, in the legislature, uh, pieces of legislation, uh, that have to do, uh, for instance, with the fundamental nature of the human person. You know, I was for many years a chair of the Ethics and Law Committee of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And the act that governed the setting up of that authority recognized the special status of the embryo. Well, why should it? Uh, in one sense, you could think of the embryo simply as another piece of human tissue uh, for which there were other uh, regulations. What about equality? I mean, there's a great equality industry in Britain, uh, probably is here as well. But why do we believe people to be equal? I mean, on the face of it, people are not equal, are they? Liberty is, is another uh, matter where we have to invoke transcendental principles. We have to go beyond the simple counting of heads. You see, I mean, that's what democracy is about, isn't it? Counting heads. Whether you do it uh, in the um, balloting uh, process, or whether you do it in opinion polls, or focus groups, or whatever it might be. So democracy uh, cannot legitimate everything. And similarly, the welfare state cannot provide everything. You remember the psychiatrist who said recently that he could provide Prozac for depression, but he couldn't provide meaning for people in their lives. Well, indeed. Uh, what about relationships? 
Uh, I mean, one of the emerging problems in our world is loneliness. Uh, well, the welfare state can't provide you with friends or uh, spouses or children or grandchildren or, you know, all that sort of wonderful network that we so often assume uh, for ourselves. So even uh, this cohesive function of religion, if you like, is not completely, even in secularized cultures, uh, completely redundant. But of course, uh, there is also another side um, to religion, which is not the cohesive, but the prophetic, which is not providing the glue for society, but challenging perceived injustice, or challenging um, whatever is going wrong in terms of relationships within society, uh, people who are left on the outside, um, all sorts of things like that. And in this, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, of course, uh, claim uh, to be prophetic religions. You know, to what extent they are and whether their prophetic role is constructive or not is another matter. But that's what they claim, and we have to take account of it. In fact, we can say, if we consider the matter carefully, that it is not just uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, that have this dimension about them. Other religions also do. I mean, Buddhism has many dimensions to it, um, but one of them certainly is uh, the possibility of seeing it as a social movement that challenged the ingrained caste system of Hinduism. Uh, similarly, uh, much later, of course, uh, Sikhism uh, was also a challenge to Hindu uh, caste. And indeed, even within Hinduism itself, there are movements like the Bhakti cult, uh, which are anti-caste. So this prophetic dimension does exist um, in different ways. Now you may say already uh, that I'm doing a kind of whitewash of religion. I mean, you may say, well, what about the dark side? What about the downside? Uh, religion uh, goes wrong, doesn't it? Um, and I think we have to be honest and admit at the outset that this is so. Religion can and does go wrong. Uh, and when it does so, uh, it causes conflict and suffering. Uh, I was um, in Bosnia during the civil war there. And the reason I'd gone there with Christian aid was to see whether Christian aid and Islamic relief could work together. Uh, to see whether we could deliver supplies to people regardless of confession. Well, as a matter of fact, this proved very difficult to do in the circumstances because the communities uh, were very divided uh, and you either worked with one or the other. But uh, we did make the attempt and uh, the point is that whilst I was there, I realized how Religion, in this case, a Christian manifestation of it, if you like, could become allied to a kind of nationalist chauvinism that uh, was part of the reason for the conflict in Bosnia. And it's not just Bosnia, it's not just the Balkans. I mean, who would have imagined that in post-Gandhian India we would be facing a real prospect of a Hindu extremist government when the outcome of this election uh, is discovered. And yes, uh, Islamic resurgence has many different aspects uh, to it, and um, I will mention some of them. Uh, but one of them, of course, is the rise of uh, Islamist radicalism uh, that is also causing immense suffering uh, not just uh, to non-Muslims, not just to Christians, though of course I know something about that, uh, but to women, uh, to Muslims who are seen as liberal or heterodox in some way. Uh, I mean, you can just multiply the kinds of people who have suffered. Uh, 
So religion can and does go wrong. I mean, we only have to turn on our televisions or to read our newspapers to see that. But in doing so, it is not unique in human experience. I mean, that's the, that's the point uh, to understand. Um, patriotism is a great thing. I mean, I'm always impressed with how uh, patriotic Americans are. Um, I mean, you sort of wear it on your sleeves, don't you? Or uh, plant those flags on your front lawns, and that's fine. Uh, but patriotism can go wrong. It can become inward-looking and excluding. Uh, it can become racist. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong with patriotism. Human love can go wrong. You know what a wonderful thing love is between parents and children, between spouses, um, relations of different kinds. But when love goes wrong, it causes havoc. So uh, if religion also goes wrong, uh, it is only one of those very important things in human life that can go wrong. And indeed, if we consider the evidence of the 20th century, let us say, the great, the really great conflicts of the 20th century were not caused by religion. You know, they were caused by secular ideologies of one kind or another. National socialism, uh, well, if it had a religious aspect to it, it was pagan, uh, Teutonic paganism that we all thought St. Boniface had destroyed, but it came back with a vengeance. A Stalinism, uh, which arguably caused more suffering than the Nazis did. The Cultural Revolution in China, so I watched it uh, with great uh, alarm because here people were trying to destroy their own culture, a very old culture as it happens. Um, Pol Pot, even the Ba'ath Party in Iraq and Syria uh, was not a religious party in any way. It was a party consciously modeled by its founders on European fascism of the 1920s and 30s. So um, if religion goes wrong and causes conflict and suffering, so does secular ideology. And if I may say in this connection, we are just beginning to see another wave of secularist ideology in the West, which is leading, in my mind, to a kind of totalitarianism. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a matter for debate. Now, having admitted this, um, that religion can go wrong, and having noticed that other things can also go wrong, I would want to say quite clearly that uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, religions are accountable in our day and in our world. And they're accountable in two ways. They're accountable, first of all, at the bar of world opinion. We do not live in an age where we can do things in a corner and no one notices. Um, sometimes representatives of religious groups say to me, uh, Bishop, uh, this is our business, we will sort it out. Well, that's not possible anymore, because the world is watching, and our business is done in full view, therefore. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, religions are accountable to one another, you see. Uh, I am a great believer in dialogue between people of different uh, religious beliefs, but I'm not a believer in what you might call kissy-kissy dialogue. You know, where we pat one another on the back and say how wonderful everyone is and so forth. No. I mean, dialogue has to be real. It has to be about real issues, real problems, real suffering. Uh, so for many years, I led on the Christian side the dialogue with Al-Azhar al-Sharif, the premier place of Sunni learning in Cairo, in Egypt. And uh, the discipline that we exercised in this dialogue was that each side would choose a topic, uh, only one topic, 
And uh, one year, I remember, the, the people in Al-Azhar chose uh, the question about the Danish cartoons. You remember the great fuss there was about them, uh, of the Prophet of Islam. Uh, and we chose the case of Mr. Abdul Rahman, uh, who had become a Christian in Afghanistan and for doing that had been sentenced to death for apostasy. Now, um, this uh, dialogue of realism, if you like, is difficult. You don't always make progress. Um, sometimes you take one step forward and several back. Uh, but in this case, uh, after several years of dialogue, uh, there has been some fruit. I remember uh, the former rector, uh, the late rector of Al-Azhar, uh, Sheikh Tantawi, uh, and I did a public lecture in Cairo. Well, my lecture then was uh, as undistinguished as my lecture now. Uh, but uh, that was not the case with Sheikh Tantawi. He very bravely said in Cairo, uh, that um, what people believed was uh, nothing to do with the state. Now, if you know the difficulties that people who change their faith in Egypt, that they have with their very identity, you will know uh, the significance of what Sheikh Tantavi was saying at the time. As far as uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews are concerned, uh, in this business of dialogue, uh, we have a very long history to call upon and many resources, many things both positive and negative. In fact, you could put it another way. There has never been a time since the emergence of Islam as a historical uh, phenomenon I mean, I say all those things deliberately, uh, when Muslims, Christians, and Jews have not been living together. Never been a time. So, uh, uh, there's a lot to say. Uh, the very beginnings of the Prophet of Islam's consciousness um, involve uh, Christians and Jews. So, according to Islamic tradition, it was a Christian monk who first recognized in the uh, young Muhammad that there was something special about him. Uh, the cousin of his first wife, of Khadija, Waraka bin Nofil, is honored in Islamic tradition for mediating Christian and Jewish knowledge to the Prophet of Islam. Uh, Waraka bin Nofil was, uh, of course, a Jewish Christian. Um, when the Prophet of Islam began his uh, preaching in Mecca, it was, of course, a preaching of a strict monotheism. He was uh, naturally opposed by the inhabitants of Mecca. Why? Because Mecca was then a center of the cult of the daughters of Allah. Allah, according to the pagan Arabs, had three daughters, Allah, Al-Manat, and Al-Uzza. And, um, uh, Mecca was the center of their cult for pilgrimage and uh, the trade that it, it brought to the Meccans. So, of course, they were opposed to somebody saying, no, there really is only one God. Uh, I mean, for Christians, it might remind us of the story of St. Paul at Ephesus. You know, again, it was a similar situation. Uh, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, but really, what they were worried about was their livelihood. Anyway, uh, although uh, Muhammad himself was protected by his influential uncle Abu Talib, uh, many of his followers, well, very few followers actually at that time, were not protected in that way. So what did he do? Eventually he sent them off uh, as refugees to the Christian empire of Abyssinia or of Ethiopia. I have actually just returned from Ethiopia and I met a group of Muslims there who are called the Habasha, who claim descent from those first refugees. And the point that they make in the situation in Ethiopia today is that they came to Ethiopia in peace. And 
that according to their tradition, it is not lawful to wage jihad against the people who gave them refuge. Now, not everyone thinks like that, but, but they do. And uh, this ought to be noted and lauded, of course. Um, <clears throat> When these refugees, these Muhajireen, arrived um, in Ethiopia, like all refugees, they were subjected to interrogation by immigration officials. But this was theological interrogation. The officials asked them what they thought or what they believed about Jesus and his mother, Mary. And the refugees uh, replied that their prophet had taught them to, that Jesus was word and spirit of God uh, and was born of a virgin. And on that basis, they were given refuge in Ethiopia. Uh, some of them returned uh, when uh, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, uh, went uh, to be the temporal as well as the spiritual leader in Medina. Uh, but some did not, as I was saying, the Habash claim to be descendants of at least some of them. Some people say uh, that Meccan Islam uh, had a positive view of Judaism and Christianity and that things went wrong in Medina. Well, uh, there is some truth in this, uh, but it's not wholly true because uh, when Muhammad arrived in Medina, Medina was full of Jews. I mean, if you look at the list of Jewish tribes that were in Medina, in fact, the very word Medina is a Jewish word. It's still used for the state of Israel. Um, the Arab word for it was Yathrib, of course. Uh, so Medina was full of Jews as well, of course, uh, uh, of uh, pagan Arabs. And uh, very shortly after arriving in Medina, uh, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, uh, pr uh, promulgated something called the Sahifat al-Medina, which you might translate a document of Medina or the constitution of Medina or the pact of Medina, I mean, different translations. Now, the remarkable thing about this document is that it gave uh, similar rights and responsibilities uh, to the two groups of the Muslims, the Muslims of Medina who had invited Muhammad to be with them and the Muslims from Mecca who had come with Muhammad. Uh, but not only them, also the Jews and by implication also the pagan Arabs. Similar rights and responsibilities. Uh, as citizens of Medina. Now, you might say that the constitution of Medina represents the first Islamic state. And people say to me in different parts of the world when I go there, uh, here or there, that they want to have an Islamic state. And I say to them, will it be like the first one? And if not, why not? Well, uh, reasons can be given. The fact of the matter is that this situation did not last very long. Uh, and very quickly suspicion developed, particularly between the Jews um, and the Prophet of Islam. Um, and uh, uh, he suspected them of um, conspiring with the people of Mecca who were, of course, after him at the time. And so uh, things began to happen. Uh, two Jewish tribes, the uh, Banu Kanuka and the Banu Nadir, were stripped of their property and possessions and exiled. Another one, the Banu Koreza, were not so lucky. Uh, their males uh, were all beheaded and the women and children were sold into slavery. Now, um, you know, I'm not saying this because of bloodlust or anything like that, but because uh, these things uh, show us what also happened in the future. Um, 
Of course, this was not the only way uh, in which things happened. The Jews of the Khyber, the Khyber was a Jewish fort some way from Medina. Uh, siege was laid to this fort uh, of the Khyber by the Muslims, and eventually it was reduced. But the Jews were allowed to stay there uh, and to continue their agricultural work, uh, which, among other things, produced very fine dates provided they paid half of their produce as tribute to the Muslims. Now again, this became a pattern for the future. This is why I'm mentioning it. Relations with the Christians uh, actually uh, were better. Uh, you will know the story of the Christians of Najran who came with their religious and political leaders to negotiate a treaty with the Prophet of Islam. Uh, when they did so, uh, they came to Medina, they were accommodated in the Prophet's mosque and they were allowed to celebrate the divine liturgy in the mosque during the negotiations. Now, I say this because if today a Christian or a Jew or any non-Muslim attempts to go in the direction of Mecca or Medina, uh, they are immediately prevented uh, because there are large signs up saying that, you know, if you're not a Muslim you, and you go beyond that point, you do so at the risk of your life. But this was not the sunnah of the Prophet. So why is the practice different today? Anyway, uh, the negotiations again uh, began with theology. The Christians of the Najran wanted to know if the Prophet of Islam believed Jesus to be the Son of God. Now, you will remember that uh, Muhammad had already denied that Allah could have daughters. So now how could he say that after all he had a son? So the, the denial, of course, which is characteristic of Islam, that Jesus is not the Son of God, was made. Uh, but the Christians of Najran uh, were not so easily put off. Uh, so they then said, uh, well, if you believe he was born of a virgin, whose son was he then? <laughs> now, the force of this question has to be appreciated uh, by the fact that in Arabic, uh, people are described uh, by being the sons sometimes the daughters, of course, also, of their father. So Osama bin Laden is Osama, the son of Laden. Abdullah bin Saud is Abdullah, the son of Saud, and so forth. So what would you say of Jesus, they asked. Islamic tradition says that uh, Muhammad did not give an answer to this uh, question at the time. But the Quran gives two answers to this question. Uh, one is the habitual use in the Quran of the title uh, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary. This is quite unique. I mean, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the only woman actually named in the Quran, by the way. Um, so he's, that is uh, the characteristic title for Jesus, Jesus, who is the son of Mary. Uh, a a term that was, had been used before in Jewish Christian polemic to cast doubt on the legitimacy of Jesus' birth, as a matter of fact, was now used by Islam, and this is to Islam's credit, uh, as a term of honor. The other answer that the Quran gives to this question of the Christians of Najran is a counter question, which is, well, whose son was Adam? And just as God had created Adam out of nothing, so he cast Jesus into Mary's womb. And the expression that is again and again used in the Quran uh, of God's creative activity is kun fayakunu. He says, be and it is. So there was not complete agreement. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the negotiations resulted in a treaty with the Christians of Najran who were allowed to remain uh, in their state and to continue to practice their faith. Now, um, <clears throat> very soon 
after the death of the Prophet of Islam, is, uh, Islam itself expanded very rapidly into what was then the Christian Middle East. You see. This is something we must never forget. All the great cities of uh, Christendom, apart from Rome itself, were all in the Middle East. Alexandria, Damascus, Jerusalem, Edessa, Constantinople, of course, and so forth. And the, um, the rate of expansion is breathtaking. So Damascus surrendered to the Muslim armies, I think within a year of the Prophet's death. The gates of Damascus, uh, deserted by the Byzantine garrison, were opened for the Muslim armies by a Christian family called Al-Mansur. You may say, well, so what? Well, Al-Mansur is the family from which Saint John of Damascus came. It was his family. And of course, as you know, he served uh, in very high office under the Caliph later on. Um, Jerusalem, when the Caliph Umar, the second Caliph, arrived in Jerusalem, the patriarch Sophronius invited him to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Omar refused on the grounds that if he prayed there, the Muslims would use it as an excuse uh, to turn the church into a mosque. So he prayed outside, and if, you, if you've been to Jerusalem, you will know the mosque of Omar stands exactly where he did pray. So perhaps he was right, and of course subsequent history uh, has shown us of numerous occasions where uh, churches were turned into mosques. Not just uh, the Christian Middle East, but the Persian Empire crumbled very, very quickly. Uh, and the Muslims were at the gates of Constantinople for hundreds of years before it fell, of course. Now, um, all of this activity uh, was marked by um, certain things that we need to note. Uh, the first is that in the course of this expansion, uh, a number of communities were destroyed. So what happened to the Banu Qureza was not unique. You see. Khalid bin Walid, the great uh, general who was chosen by Abu Bakr to put down the rebellion uh, that occurred in Arabia immediately after the Prophet of Islam's death, the so-called Rida, in his uh, military campaigns was so severe that the second caliph, Omar, had to discipline him and to relieve him of command. Other communities were dispersed. Uh, which ones were they? Well, there were many of them, but uh, for a start, the Jews and the Christians of Peninsular Arabia. You remember those who had been allowed to stay in the Khaybar and in Najran? Now, a prophetic tradition was discovered uh, which said that Arabia should have only one religion. Yeah. Um, so the Jews and the Christians were expelled. This tradition, by the way, has been used just very recently by the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia uh, to advise rulers in the Gulf that they should not allow churches to be built in the Gulf states. Um, <clears throat> so it has uh, contemporary relevance. Uh, so what happened to the Jews and the Christians? Well, the Jews, we are told, migrated to the region around Jericho. And the Christians went to Iraq. This is nothing new under the sun. I mean, many of the difficulties that we are facing have very deep historical roots. Uh, destruction, dispersion, and then the institutionalization of what you might call systemic discrimination. That is to say, the emergence of the so-called dhimma. The word dhimma means responsibility or the duty of Muslims to protect their non-Muslim subjects. Uh, but very quickly, uh, particularly under the reign of a caliph known as Umar uh, bin Abdulaziz, 
the, the dhimma was uh, made very restrictive indeed. So it was now not just that you had to pay special taxes like the poll tax, the jizya, or the kharaj, the land tax, uh, but uh, restrictions were imposed on freedom of worship, for instance. So um, Christians and Jews, uh, and later on Zoroastrians as well, could not display any religious symbol of theirs openly. Uh, they could not uh, build new churches. They could repair uh, old ones with the permission of the caliph. I mean, all of these things are still relevant uh, in the Islamic world. Uh, their homes must not be taller than the homes of Muslims. Uh, they could ride donkeys but not horses. They had to wear a special dress. They must give way to Muslims in the street. When they paid the jizya, it must be with a sign of humiliation, which was usually a blow on the neck by the person receiving the jizya and so forth. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, the dhimma, of course, lasted for centuries. And uh, quite apart from its actual provisions that were sometimes strictly observed and sometimes not so strictly observed, it created a mentality both in the rulers and in the ruled. Uh, in the rulers to treat people who were not Muslims in a particular way, uh, in an inferior way if you like, and in the rule, it created an abiding inferiority complex. Uh, this dhimmi mentality still exists, of course, um, when Christians try to outdo Muslims in being better Muslims than, than Muslims, um, and uh, in uh, capitulating to demands uh, made on the grounds of Sharia uh, or of policy, and becoming apologists, as it were, sometimes even, for these things. Uh, it would be very interesting to see how Western policy, for instance, in the Middle East displays this dhimmi mentality to one extent or another. Now, the, the problem with the dhimma is this, uh, it's, uh, the dilemma is this, that on the one hand, it is an advance. It was a way in which the, newly, the new conquerors uh, made provision for newly conquered peoples to continue to live within their domains. The issue is that uh, radical Islamist movements in today's world seek to impose the dhimma on non-Muslims today and have succeeded in doing so to one extent or another in countries like Iran, Pakistan, Egypt uh, and many other examples can be given, certain states in Malaysia. Uh, for instance. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's the issue. Now, in spite of being dhimmis, there is also uh, the contribution that Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians, later on other people, made to the development of what is called Islamic civilization. I mean, the question is, how did these people from the desert develop this incredible material, intellectual, and cultural civilization. How did they do it? And the answer is very largely because of the contributions of conquered peoples who brought their skills, their knowledge, their culture in different ways, both in the creation of a material civilization but also intellectually. Now, many, many examples of this can be given, for instance, the role of uh, Persians uh, in contributing to the development of patterns of governance in the Islamic world. Um, the Islamic world uh, was supreme uh, in um, the seas uh, for a very long time. How did they come to be supreme? Well, the, the contribution of Copts in building the ships has something to do with it. But the example I, I might be worth giving uh, this evening is the way in which uh, Greek uh, philosophical, scientific, and medical material was translated into Arabic and subsequently 
transmitted back to the West. Now, we hear about this a great deal that um, the recovery of Aristotle, for instance, uh, by the West was because it received this Greek learning back from the Arabs. That is true. But the prior question is, how did the Arabs get it? And the answer is that in nearly every case, through Christian translators and mainly through clergy who were trans... I mean, clergy do have their uses uh, sometimes. So the, the schools that were established by the caliphs uh, in Baghdad, for instance, were staffed by Christians. Uh, just to take an example uh, of a father and son team, uh, Hunan ibn Ishaq, and his son Ishaq ibn Hunan, the father knew better Greek, and so translated from Greek into Syriac, a Christian language, of course. Uh, and the son knew better Arabic, so he translated from Syriac into Arabic. Between them, they translated the whole of the Greek medical corpus into Arabic. This was then transmitted to the West, uh, and in Oxford, for instance, with which I have something to do, I mean, it was the basis of the medical syllabus right up to the 18th century. Now, so how was it transmitted? Well, two routes, actually. Uh, the, uh, the way in which Islamic names are found in European languages is a dead giveaway. So Ibn Rushd is Averroes. Ibn Sina is Avicenna. What happens to B's and V's in Hebrew? You see, so it was Jewish traders, um, sometimes translators also, who transmitted this learning back to Europe. That was one route. The other was the Arabic-speaking Christian communities of the West. Not of the East, but of the West. Where were they? Well, Spain and Portugal, of course, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, the Moz Arabic community. You know, we still have the Moz Arabic liturgy, don't we? Um, Moz Arabic simply comes from the Arabic word Mustarab, somebody who has become an Arab. Uh, they transmitted this knowledge uh, to the monasteries of Western Europe and from there, of course, to the incipient universities. Now, uh, <clears throat> Uh, there was also a great deal of dialogue between Christians and Muslims. Uh, in the first two centuries of Islam, you, from the Christian side, we can record at least nine extremely distinguished theologians who engaged in dialogue with Islam. St. John of Damascus, uh, of course, being one of them, uh, but many others. And similarly, there were people from the Muslim side. Now, the point is that this uh, feast of reason and flow of soul or is it the other way around? Uh, I'm a bit jet-lagged. Um, came to an abrupt end for two main reasons, which remain important for us today. One was the Crusades, you see. All sorts of things can be said and are said about the Crusades. Um, there was great barbarity, but not only on one side. Uh, certainly the Crusaders' behavior when they conquered Jerusalem is inexcusable. Um, but why did the Crusades happen? Well, there are at least three reasons uh, which always need to be kept in mind, whatever happened subsequently. Uh, the first was that the newly converted to Islam Seljuk Turks were preventing Christian pilgrims from Europe uh, uh, going to the Holy Land. Now, the impact of this can only be imagined if we think that in those days, for Christians in Europe, pilgrimage to the Holy Land was the fifth gospel. That was how you understood the, uh, the first four, by going and seeing where it had happened. Uh, secondly, the Fatimi Caliph al-Hakim, who I think in all charity, has to be said, uh, had lost his mental balance, uh, completely destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, right down to the tomb. I mean, the description of the, dis of the, of the destruction is with us. He also, by the way, destroyed many Muslim 
holy places and substituted his name for the name of God uh, even in uh, the mosques and in the prayers. Um, but the, of course, in Europe, the destruction of the Holy Sepulchre caused immense grief and alarm. Thirdly, uh, the Eastern Emperor, Alexius Comnenus, directly appealed to Pope Urban for help because of the way in which the Muslim armies were pressurizing Constantinople. Now, those are the reasons. Uh, I say to my Muslim friends sometimes, um, when we talk about the Crusades, that the Crusades were uh, waged not only against Muslims. You know, for instance, there was a crusade against the Jews. There was a crusade against the Albigensian heretics. There was even a crusade against Constantinople. The conquest of Constantinople by the Latins arguably is one of the reasons for its fall later on to the Turks. Um, and then, uh, as the Arab historian Amin Malouf uh, points out, uh, that uh, it is certainly arguable that the people who suffered most during the Crusades were the Eastern Christians. Uh, so they were regarded uh, as a fifth column by the Muslims and as heretics by the West. So they were caught in the middle. Uh, they were no one's friends. The other great uh, interruption as it were, well, more than an interruption, uh, uh, was the arrival of the Mongols. You see, uh, one of the ways of understanding the events of this period is to, is to realize that there were people from Central Asia continually arriving in the Middle East and in India and in parts of Europe. The Turks are, of course, one such people. The Mongols were another. Uh, but when the Mongols arrived, they caused incredible destruction, unimaginable. Uh, the Arab historian Ibn al-Athir says, in writing about the destruction, that he wished that his mother had never given birth to him because of what he had seen. And in 1258, the Mongols uh, captured Baghdad, pillaged it, and destroyed it. Uh, this was an apocalyptic event in Muslim self-consciousness. Uh, the Persian poet Saadi, uh, writing about it, says, Muhammad, if you are to come on Judgment Day, come now, because this is Judgment Day. But not everyone suffered uh, in the same way. Uh, Holaku, the Mongol leader, uh, had his principal wife was a Christian, an historian Christian. So the Nestorians didn't suffer as much. Some of the Mongols had been converted to Shia Islam, so the Shia didn't suffer as much. But the brunt of the uh, Mongol wrath fell on the Sunnis. So you see, when we read of Sunnis and Shias in Baghdad today and the Christians, the uh, Chaldean, uh, Caldo-Assyrian Christians, this goes back a very long way. One result, of course, of the arrival of the Mongols was to put an end to Arab supremacy in the Islamic world. The Turks were doing that already, of course. Uh, the Mamelukes, uh, a slave dynasty from the Caucasus, had also been doing it in Egypt and Syria. Uh, but now, the um, a very um, small tribe uh, called the Osmanli, um, began to be prominent. You know, we've got to watch small tribes. Um, the Osmanli, who were they? Well, the name gives it away, doesn't it? Because this was the emergence of the great Ottoman Empire, which replaced Arab supremacy, a Turkish Empire, and uh, many, many volumes have been written about the Ottoman Empire, but there are one or two things that I want to remind you uh, of uh, because they are relevant for our situation today. Uh, the first is that the Ottomans, when they uh, 
became powerful, borrowed an idea from pre-Islamic Persia called the Millat system. The pre-Islamic Persians had organized religious communities into Millats that were um, uh, autonomous communities more or less living their own lives as long as they acknowledged uh, the Shah as supreme. They borrowed this and they married this to the Islamic idea of the Dhimma. Now, um, uh, when they did so, um, of course, um, the leaders of these millets became very prominent people. And thereby hangs a tale as well. Uh, ethnic, religious, um, and come back to that in a moment. The other thing about the Ottomans was that they claimed, their rulers claimed the title of Caliph. Now, on the face of it, this was absurd because the Caliph had to be an Arab and had to be of the tribe of the Quraysh. So how could a jumped-up Turk claim to be the Caliph? Well, the reason given was that the Ottomans now, the Ottoman ruler was the only one conducting jihad. That is why he could claim to be the Caliph. And where was he conducting jihad? Mainly in southern and eastern Europe. Elsewhere as well, of course. Um, the Ottomans also instituted the system of Dev Shirme, which was the enslaving of Christian boys from the Balkans and conscripting them into the civil service and the armed forces. The reason I mention all of this is that um, the millet system uh, has left its mark on societies that were governed by the Ottomans. Uh, that is why in the conflict in the Balkans, if you did not know that these communities had identities that had been formed over centuries, you would not solve the problem. In fact, the problem has not been solved. Similarly, in Iraq, the attempt to impose a unitary form of government in Iraq is completely mistaken. Um, and this is why the, the Kurdish people in the north have, are virtually running their own state. Um, from the middle of the 19th century, because of Western pressure, the Ottomans began uh, a system of legal reform called the Tanzimat, uh, and also issued a succession of firmans, a firman in Persian uh, means an order, uh, basically beginning the abolition of the Dhimma and of the millet system. And so the eventual result of this was that for the first time since the rise of Islam in the 7th century, Christians and Jews and others found themselves, in theory anyway, to be equal citizens with Muslims. Now, um, Zionism was already in the air. And many Jews in the world of Islam, as well as in Europe and elsewhere, had their eyes now fixed on the Zionist uh, hope which at that time was not geographically defined, by the way. But the Christians, um, of course, uh, remained. And um, when the Ottoman Empire uh, began to unravel, very quickly and very early, I mean, already in 1833, Greece becomes independent, uh, the Christians played a huge part in the development of the Nahada, that is to say, of Arab consciousness. You remember how the Arabs had lost supremacy uh, of the Muslim world. Now, uh, in the early 20th century, end of the 19th, uh, there was uh, the uh, renewal of Arab consciousness, that is what Nahada means, uh, and the rise of Arab nationalism, which was defined by culture and language and history and not so much by religion. Although, of course, Islam was also acknowledged as the product of Arab genius. 
Now the point about the Nahada is that the Christian Arabs played a disproportionate role in its development. There is a whole string of Arab leaders, Constantine Zurek, Anton Farah, Butros Ghali, who the ancestor of the present Butros, Butros Ghali, who became Prime Minister of Egypt. I mean, unthinkable. Um, and, um, and indeed, Michel Aflaq, the founder of the Ba'ath Party. Not only Arab nationalism, Turkish nationalism also arose. You see, uh, uh, because the Turks were losing their empire all around them, in the Balkans, in the Arab world, and so on, the question arose, where would the Turks go? So Turkey for the Turks has its origins in that kind of mentality. You know, we may deplore it. We may question the way in which uh, the Greeks and the Syrians and the Armenians, of course, and the Kurds have been treated by Turkey. But that is the background to it. That is why. Turkey must be for the Turks because they'd lost everything else. And Indian Muslim nationalism, of course, also arose. Uh, the consciousness that um, an independent India would have an inbuilt Hindu majority and Muslims would not be able to live um, according to their culture and their background. Uh, I mean, Indian Muslim nationalism that resulted in the birth of Pakistan was never theocratic. You know, it was cultural, historical, uh, all of those things, but not theocratic. I mean, Muhammad Ali Jinnah had to be taught how to pray when he became the governor general of Pakistan. Um, of course, this is not to say <laughs> that it has not become theocratic since. Of course it has, but in its origin it was not. However, the point is that this um, kind of nationalism, which was very widespread in the Islamic world uh, in the 50s and 60s, began to lose force. And the question is why and how? And the answer is mainly because of the rise of Islamist radicalism. So the charge was that these nationalists were not true Muslims. They had borrowed their nationalism from somewhere else. And I mean, there was some truth in this charge, as I have said. Uh, the patterns of governance that they often advocated were Western. They'd often been educated in Western institutions. Um, now, uh, there, were a, there were and are a whole number of reasons why Islamism has become so important in the Islamic world. What we must not do, however, is to confuse the, is the radical Islamist agenda with the reasons for its growth. You see, on the one hand, the agenda is quite clear. In, for example, in Sunni Islamism, uh, the restoration of the caliph, abolished by Kamal Ataturk when he became the ruler of Turkey. Um, why is the restoration of the caliph important? Because the caliph provides the focal point for the coming together of the whole Muslim Ummah, the whole Islamic people. Uh, it is a vision of pan-Islam. This is why uh, British-born and European-born uh, young Muslim men are fighting in Syria today. You know, it does not recognize boundaries. Uh, even an Islamic state is a strictly provisional arrangement pending the emergence of a pan-Islamic uh, dispensation. So the caliph is vital to, to this uh, vision of the single ummah, of pan-Islam. The imposition of Sharia as understood by these people, which often does not take into account uh, history and how Sharia in fact was used by various Muslim states and, and rulers. Uh, and then, of course, one of the features of the introduction of Sharia is the reintroduction of the Dhimma, so that non-Muslims are separated out from the business of governance, particularly. Uh, they are not given equal rights in the legal sense, um, and that also applies, of course, to groups like women, uh, for very similar reasons. 
and uh, then, of course, the restoration of lands lost to Islam. Which ones are they? Well, you could argue, uh, the Indian Mujahideen do argue this, India is a land lost to Islam. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula is a land lost to Islam. And there are many features in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, of course, and many issues of justice. I recognize that. Uh, right is not on one side in that conflict. But a basic issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the perception that this was a Muslim land which is now no longer ruled by Muslims. And until and unless that is addressed, the question will not go away. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Shia, is, uh, Shia Islamism has many of the same features, except that uh, the reintroduction of the caliphate is replaced by the expectation of the imam. Now, uh, to understand anything that the Islamic Republic of Iran does, you have to take Shia eschatology seriously. A senior Iranian minister said to me that everything that um, the Iranian government does is to promote justice so that the coming of the Imam may be hastened. You see. If you don't understand that, you won't understand why they do certain things. I mean, it may look absurd or uh, difficult to understand um, from a Western point of view. Uh, there's a whole industry in Iran featuring the, uh, this expectancy of the coming of the Imam. Uh, senior Ayatollah said to me once, he said, um, Bishop, uh, when Jesus comes back, uh, will our Imam be with him? <laughs> so, you know, given these difficult questions, no doubt you have some uh, this evening as well. I said, the Bible teaches us that when Jesus comes back, all of God's friends will be with him. Uh, let it go at that. Um, <laughs> the other feature of Shia uh, radical, radical Islamism is the notion of vilayat e faqih that is to say, the ruler of the Islamic, the rule of the Islamic lawyer the Islamic lawyer as ruler. Now, uh, there is very little precedent for this in Shia polity. Certainly in the Iranian constitution of 1906, uh, some provision was made for the ulama to interpret uh, the Sharia to legislators. But now, in place of the imam, it is the lawyer who rules. Having said that, of course, there are reasons why Islamism has grown in both its Sunni and its Shia manifestations. One of them is clearly the experience of imperialism. Jamaluddin Afghani, the great Islamic reformer who is claimed by both progressives uh, and by uh, radical uh, and extremist Islamists, uh, struggled against Western imperial ambitions all his life. But it was not just Western imperialism. There was also a struggle against the Ottomans and their princelings in various places. Um, because another feature uh, of uh, these reform movements in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, was the realization that Islamic rulers themselves were corrupt and could be corrupted by Western or other imperial powers. Um, what about neo-imperialism? Yes, I think that also played a part. Um, I was taught by a man who took an active part uh, in the destabilization of the Mossadegh government in Iran in the 1950s. So because uh, this moderately socialist government in Iran would not give oil concessions to uh, the Anglo-Americans, I think it has to be said, uh, he, the, he was uh, destabilized and removed and the Shah was reinstated. 
Well, it can be said that what was sown in 1953 was reaped in 1979. Of course it was. Um, the failure of both command economy, socialism, and capitalism in the Islamic world. So command economy socialism in Syria and in Egypt, you know, the usual things, um, inefficient production, shoddy goods in the shops, if there were any goods in the shops, hidden unemployment, uh, mass education without any regard for what young people would do after they'd been educated, etc. You know, all the sort of fruits of centralized planning. But um, capitalism also failed in countries like Pakistan and uh, Iran. Uh, I was working with very poor people, uh, brick and workers in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, and I met a World Bank official uh, who said to me, he said, we only work with the rich. We only know the rich, and we work therefore with them. We are hoping that what we are doing with the rich is trickling down to your people. And I said, well, I, I couldn't, to be honest, see any signs of this. Um, and the World Bank has listened to that kind of thing, I, I have to say, but this is what was said to me, no doubt to other people. The Shah, on the other hand, with money from rising oil prices, uh, was building a kind of Switzerland in North Tehran, uh, with an elite living there uh, who uh, benefited from rising oil prices and arms imports. So um, uh, the slums, the people living in the slums of South Tehran were not allowed to come to North Tehran. So when the revolution began, what did they do? They marched onto North Tehran and they hung the people who lived there from the lampposts. That's what happened. Um, In the big cities, in Algiers or Cairo, uh, a large number of young men were able to receive just about enough education to know that they were not getting, or to think they were not getting what they deserved. Certainly that feeds into the Islamic recruitment agenda. Um, but not only urbanized young people, but in along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border, the string of Deobandi madrasas, where um, the children of refugees from Afghanistan uh, and um, the children of poor parents in Pakistan who could not afford any other kind of education for their children, uh, they sent their children there. That is where they were radicalized. That is why the word Taliban came into being. It means students. Where are they students? They're students in the madrasas. Uh, and uh, whatever else we may say uh, about the Pakistani government's policies, uh, one uh, reason for the emergence of the Taliban is the complete failure of the government of Pakistan's educational policy. I mean, there, there you are. I mean, that's, that's straight. Now, uh, uh, I want to um, bring this to an end. Uh, a number of issues uh, remain uh, arising out of uh, all that we've thought about, which we must address. The first is, um, what is the relationship of religion to the state? You see, uh, one feature of uh, Islamist radicalism has been uh, to uh, ensure that the Westphalian consensus of consigning religion to the private sphere uh, is no longer possible to hold. So the Westphalian consensus is dead, I mean, wherever we may be, partly because of uh, radical Islamism, uh, but for other reasons as well. The question now is not whether religion should have a role in public life, but what kind of role it should have. Uh, some years ago, I conducted a written dialogue with the man who was then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Pakistan, Justice Naseem Hassan Shah. 
uh, and in, in his submission uh, in the dialogue, uh, he said he believed in an Islamic state, but he believed in an Islamic state that would encourage the persuasion of Muslims to be good Muslims and not their coercion. Well, I don't object to that. Uh, and in fact, we can say that any role that religion has in polity today must be persuasive and not coercive. So it must persuade not just the state but people generally by the quality of its arguments and not by privilege or whatever else it may be. Secondly, the question of the relationship to democracy. Now, of course, uh, democracy has largely arisen in uh, situations where the Judeo-Christian tradition has been dominant. Or in situations like India, where the dominant tradition has been uh, modified by its contact with the Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, that's a subject for another lecture. But of course, it is possible for other people also to argue uh, that uh, their traditions are also friendly to democracy. So, for instance, Muslims sometimes argue that the idea of shura, of consultation, which is in the Quran itself, but uh, also in Muslim history, uh, can lead to proper democratic institutions. Or it may not be something explicitly Islamic, it may be customary. Uh, so the introduction of a renewed lawyer jirga in Afghanistan for the writing of the new constitution uh, was a good step because it, it um, involved a traditional Afghan, in fact, Pakhtun institution uh, to do something democratic. Now, the jirga, of course, was not left uh, as it as it is traditionally, it was widened to include women, for instance. But nevertheless, a, a, a traditional institution was used. Uh, I asked Tony Blair when he was still the Prime Minister whether he intended to do something similar in Iraq. And he said, oh, you know, the, this is for the Iraqi people to decide. So I said, well, yes, but Britain and America have a considerable presence in Iraq, which they did at that time. Um, you, you know, don't you have a say in it? Would customary Arab values, the idea of Be'a, for instance, of pledging allegiance to a ruler, I mean, those sorts of things be used? Would the Ottoman background of uh, high walls uh, between different communities be recognized and worked with or not? Well, in the end, it wasn't, of course. Uh, and uh, we will see what the results of that will be. The other thing uh, which has uh, come to the fore, and I've written about it in relation to the Arab Spring, is that in the Islamic context, majoritarian democracy, perhaps in any context, majoritarian democracy is not enough. Uh, tyranny is tyranny even if it is a tyranny of the majority. See, no less tyranny for those who experience it. It's not enough. Uh, and in the Egyptian case, for instance, I was arguing when President Morsi was still in power, that there needs to be a Bill of Rights um, that safeguards uh, basic principles like uh, the equality of all before the law, one law for all, uh, the idea of a common citizenship so that the non-Muslims would not lapse into being dhimmis again, uh, even if people didn't intend that. That might be the result, uh, and so on. Then there is the question of the relationship of religion to law. Um, as I was saying, uh, many of our moral codes uh, have arisen uh, in a religious context and have therefore influenced the emergence of public law. Of course they have. But the question is, should public law now have a certain autonomy? Uh, and I believe that it, it, it should in, in any context, uh, Western or Islamic or, or indeed uh, any other, it should have a proper autonomy. 
whilst recognizing uh, the inspiration that has given rise to it in one context or another. So in the Egyptian situation, the key question was, would the, the new Egyptian constitution recognize Sharia as the only source of law or as one of the sources of law? I mean, in a country like Egypt or in Pakistan, of course, uh, Sharia will have some influence in the development of, uh, of law, of polity. Uh, one of the, well, the most distinguished chief justice of Pakistan so far was a Christian, uh, Chief Justice Cornelius, devout Roman Catholic, daily mass goer. And he was asked by a sort of rather rude journalist once, he said, you know, how can you, a Christian, the journalist said, be the chief justice of an Islamic state? And Cornelius thought for a while and he said, uh, well, he said, constitutionally, I'm a Muslim. Uh, meaning by that, that in taking account of the development of law, and he was the author of the 1961 constitution, he had to take Islamic jurisprudence into account. But of course, uh, the problem with uh, the question about Sharia is that the, the principles of movement in the schools of law, in the Sunni schools of law, for example, uh, have simply been ignored by radical Islamists. So uh, in some schools of law, like the Hanafi, uh, there are radical principles of movement that could change the nature of Sharia in relation to modern society. And this has been recognized by Islamic scholars going back at least 200 years. But it is as if the debate never happened. There are more conservative principles like maslaha, uh, which allow a jurist to take into account uh, the common good in uh, making decisions based on the provisions of Sharia. But again, uh, this is being widely ignored. So, um, what we are left with is unreconstructed 7th century material which is being regarded as suitable uh, for the 21st century. Um, and in, in this connection, I mean in the, in the context of uh, the Sharia in the West, uh, particularly the demand uh, to recognize Sharia in terms of public law in the West, I have opposed this on the grounds that uh, Sharia understood in this sense opposes the basic principles of Western public law. So uh, in Sharia there are the three great inequalities. The inequality between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. I mean for instance a non-Muslim can never inherit from a Muslim. The inequality between men and women and the inequality between slave and free. Now, um, when Archbishop uh, Rowan Williams, when he was Archbishop of Canterbury and the then Chief Justice, Lord Chief Justice in Britain, uh, recommended that Sharia ought to be recognized in terms of public law, um, I said all these things and they both replied and they said, oh, you know, the bishop doesn't understand what we are saying. We are not asking for hand choppings and amputations and all that kind of thing. We are." we are asking for a recognition of the softer aspects of Sharia. Well, what are they? Uh, and they said family law. That was the example they gave, family law. Well, let's look at family law. Um, divorce, I mean, a, a man can divorce in a certain way, uh, according to Sharia, but a woman cannot uh, divorce in the same way. She must if she wishes to divorce, obtain it in a roundabout way, even if she can get it. So there's no equality there. Uh, what about the custody of children? At the very time that the Lord Chief Justice in Britain was advocating the recognition of Sharia family law, the law lords who were then the Supreme Court uh, in Britain, they now call themselves the Supreme Court, same people, different name, um, were uh, having one of their last sittings and the custom used to be when the law lords uh, sat to rule on appeals, 
that a bishop in the Lord sat with them. And uh, I was the bishop on duty that day, so I was sitting with them. And one of the appeals that they were ruling on was uh, of a Lebanese woman, Muslim woman, against deportation. And they ruled in her favor because they said if she was deported to the Lebanon under Sharia law, her son would be taken from her and given to her husband. And this, they said, would be a violation of her fundamental human rights. At the same time as the Lord Chief Justice was saying, let us recognize Sharia family law in terms of public law in Britain. Now, um, <clears throat> there are also questions about the justifiability of conflict. We are living in an age where there will be more and more non-conventional conflict. We heard about that already. Uh, some Christians are pacifists. I praise God for them. I am not. Uh, I think the Christian just war tradition can be used and adapted uh, in terms of our understanding of non-conventional conflict. But uh, it would be of great help to the international community if Muslims and Christians could agree in terms of their particular traditions when conflict might be justified and when not. You see. Uh, I mean, it would help decision-making a very great deal. Now, this raise, does raise the question of jihad. Uh, for 200 years, moderate Muslim scholars have been saying jihad is only permissible as a defensive war when Islam is in danger. The radical Islamists have overturned that and said this is not the case. So when is jihad permissible? I mean, this is a question that Muslims have to answer, not just individual Muslims, but collectively. Um, when the Wahhabis began a jihad against the British in India in the 19th century, the Muslim ulama of India declared that this jihad was illegal because Islam was not in danger. And that, for many years, put an end to Wahhabi pretensions in India. But what about now? Uh, indeed, uh, not just Muslims and Christians, uh, and indeed Jews, but also people of other faiths who have a view about the justifiability of conflict need to uh, contribute to this decision making. I think this is something uh, that uh, believers can contribute uh, to, towards international peace. Will they do so? Finally, reciprocity. Um, I once asked a very distinguished Saudi ambassador, I said, Mr. Ambassador, there are mosques in London and Rome and Paris, and why are there no churches in Saudi Arabia? And he looked at me, and this is the answer he gave. He said, but there are no mosques in the Vatican. <laughs> yeah, seriously, that's what he said. Now, I mean, this is simply not acceptable. Uh, there has to be reciprocity. Uh, things can't all be just one way. Uh, when I was the Bishop of Rywind, I was, uh, we were given a plot of land in a very nice middle-class area. And these very well-educated Muslims came to me and he, they said, Bishop, they said, please don't build a church here. Build a school, we will send our children to your school, but don't build a church. Why not? Another church that we had built, the present bishop was telling me that 25 years on, those living around the church have not allowed it to be used for worship. I have a, a very fine acquaintance uh, in one of the ministries, uh, influential ministries in Iran. And I asked him one day, I said, how many churches have been built in Iran since the revolution? And he said, none, the Christians don't need them. So I said, how do you know that? You know, have you asked the Christians whether they need these churches or not? Now, <clears throat> I am aware that this business of reciprocity can become simply tit for tat. I mean, I've done it myself. I've just done it, haven't I? And I think we need to uh, make sure that the question of reciprocity is not merely tit for tat. 
that it is actually a part of our dialogue which leads to a common commitment to uphold fundamental freedoms wherever we have influence or power. I mean, certainly in my uh, engagement in dialogue with my Muslim friends, uh, this uh, is always on the agenda. So, um, of course, where we can, we must uphold the right of Muslims to freedom of uh, belief, to freedom to practice their belief. Uh, but we must also expect from them to uphold similar freedoms where their writ runs. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, <laughs>